Welcome to the Max Out Mindset Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Larry Woodman, sometimes known as Doc in the Mindset World. I always say that given the talent, experience of the athletes and coaches, the depth, the health, and the intangibles, my definition of Max Out Mindset is can the team reach the limits of their capabilities? And then can they do it under pressure? Because I always say, uh, if you can't do it under pressure when it matters the most, what's the point? And uh, I do this podcast because I've been blessed over the last 20 plus years to work with some of the most phenomenal athletes, coaches, and teams, and leaders in the country. And um, uh, this last year in particular, uh, it's been just crazy. Some of the teams that I've been able to be around that have put themselves in a position to max out. And then, of course, when I have a guest on, of course, we want to spend more time learning from them. So this is a, another edition of a repeat guest. So I don't have to go through all of her accolades, but it, she's a product of Omaha Marion. She was a old school dual division one athlete, both in volleyball and basketball at the University of Nebraska, which she was on a team that won a national championship at Nebraska back in the 1990s. She's been a head coach of volleyball for a long time, first at Omaha South, now for several years at Skip Catholic. Of course, this is coach Renee Saunders, who is now the seven time in a row winner of the class B volleyball state championships in the state of Nebraska, which is a record that uh, probably nobody thought would be broken. Uh, Bellevue West and I think uh, Shickley, I think both had six in a row, uh, but now Scott Catholic out of Omaha has now won seven straight state championships. So welcome again to the Max Out Mindset podcast in a less COVID world than last time coach. That's right. Well, thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk to you, but I'm honored to be a two-time guest. Yeah, well, we have a lot to talk about. And, uh, you know, before we even get into kind of your story again here, I was thinking, obviously, um, just because of last night, we'll put this into historical perspective, but you were watching the uh, Gretna Omaha Westside Class A football match, which was a battle for two and a half hours. It ultimately came down to one final drive in the last 30 seconds from the one yard line uh, for West side and Gretna held them in a unbelievable battle as a coach and as a fan. I mean, what were you, what were your thoughts as you were watching end game in particular of the, uh, of the West side Gretna match? Well, I think anytime you come down to end game, it comes down to execution, you know, it doesn't matter the sport, you know, you, you know, from volleyball, it's from point 20, you know, in football, it's the two minute drill. Um, you know, so watching both teams the whole night, it was a defensive battle. And I think Vers said it best. It's going to come down to like one breakaway play, like one great play. And, you know, it was funny because there were great plays and then not scoring. So it was kind of like a duel back and forth. It was like stop after stop after stop. But it seemed like at the very end, um, de the defense for Gretna, like their defensive coordinator did a great job of picking the right formations and the right schemes to combat West Side's end game offense. And I think that's the fun part about football is it's kind of, you know, you watch a lot of film, you scout it, you have a plan, but if the other team doesn't do what you plan for, then obviously, you know, it's kind of like a chess battle back and forth. So, um, you know, for me, it came down to execution. I felt like Gretna executed their defense better than West Side executed their offense. And that was the difference in the game. And, you know, you have a couple, you have a great catch to get them down to the, the two yard line and then you have a sack to push them back. And then you have kind of a, a fumbled, you know, snap, like you have some things that go on that, you know, just they didn't execute and Gretna did and Gretna got the win. So pretty cool for those kids. Great yeah, game back and forth. You didn't hate to see a person or a team lose in that situation, but um, it was fun to watch. Yeah. It's sport, isn't it? Sometimes there's heartache. I always say you have to put your heart on the line when you're trying to do something either individually or as a team, something great. And um you know, both teams showed tremendous grit and come back over and over and over. And obviously, you know, better than I, or we know equally, right? I mean, there only can be one winner in sport and um, at least on the scoreboard. But I, but I think as time and reflection happens, they, they'll hold their heads high and there won't be any regret from uh, anything they had to do preparation wise, you know, maybe execution wise, like you said, but both teams, um, made incredible stops along the way but I was just curious kind of your feelings because you're sitting there not with the same emotions attached to your own team and trying to be in in the present moment when you're trying to make adjustments for your own team but you know what that feels like to be an end game and so we're going to talk about that today because you had some unique 
end games that you hadn't had to deal with before. Um, so I really want to talk about maybe this two year last two year journey. When we last visited, you were uh, you had just won your fifth state championship in a row, um, and you were coming back with a very experienced team. And we're in the middle of COVID and all that craziness. And I want you to take me back first. Um, so I have to reflect a little bit back to the team that won their sixth state championship. Um, what stood out to you about um, what was necessary to get that team to what I always say, put them in a position to max out when it matters the most? Like, what do you remember about that team and what your thoughts were in the off season getting ready for that and what it took to um, get them there? I, to have a season is step one. You know, that was when we were in a little bit of limbo. If are we going to play or not going to play? And OPS had chosen not to have a season. And, you know, so you saw kids seasons taken away from them. Like, is this going to happen statewide? So step one was having summer conditioning. You know, we could get 10 kids together and finding a way through that. So I think 2019 season was an emotional, mentally grueling season because you just didn't know if there was going to be an end, right? Like, or is it going to be the end you hope for, right? Like, are we going to make it through a whole season? Are there going to be a, is there going to be a state championship? And there's a lot of credit to the NSAA for finding a way to make it possible for kids to compete. You know, they could have very easily like pulled the plug and just said, nope, we're not even going to risk it, you know, but they, they let the kids play. So that was part one. Um, part two was the kids making a commitment to their season. Um, obviously we returned almost all of our starting lineup. Um, and then with that comes a whole different set of expectations. You know, when, as a coach, when you have a couple of the best players on the floor and you don't win, then it's on you. Right. So a little bit more pressure actually, when you have those really great players, um, from my end, you know, um, and then it's the part of like, well, we've won this many in a row, you know, we can't become complacent. You know, so there's like the discipline, the commitment, um, trying to stay away from complacency, um, knowing that at the end, there's a good chance that if all if all the stars align and everything happens like it's supposed to happen, you know, there's a good chance we're going to face Norris and they're a really, really good team too, you know, so you don't want to ever go backwards in a season, you know, you always want to keep like progressing on what you've done and like we lost to Lincoln Southwest, we had a speed bump in the season and that was very beneficial to us because we get in the state tournament, we're in the finals, we drop a set to Norris. You know, if we haven't been there before, the outcome could be very different. So I think, you know, facing failure and, and learning from it is part of our process. And so it was really important for us in that season to make sure our kids were failing and challenged and able to continue to get better as the season went on. But, you know, the biggest thing was being the last team standing, whether that was in the state tournament or if it was, you know, the season ended because nobody else could play and we're the last team able to play, you know, like that was kind of our outlook on it. Let's be the last team standing or one of the last two teams standing. And that's, that was our goal. So let me ask you this. You mentioned Lincoln Southwest. It was one of those tournament formats, best of three. You did lose that match. Um, in reflection, what did you learn about your team and yourself that helped you move forward? I think our biggest thing we learned that was different from like the first three years that Lindsay was in the program, Lindsay Krause, who's at Nebraska now, um, one of the best players in the country, you know, always in the, t of every national ranking that comes out, she's in the top three. Um, she, she was a terminator, right? But I think what happened freshman, sophomore, junior year, she trained with the national team and she missed the beginning of the season. So we learned how to win without her. Her senior year, she did not have that. So we kind of used her as like a security blanket, like give her the ball, give her the ball when things got tight. Well, we were in a situation in Southwest where she was back row. Um, everybody was like kind of looking to her to help us out, I felt. And when she like, she had a, I think she hit a ball in the net from the back row and it was just kind of like, so the sales go out. So what we learned is we need to, we need to be able to win without Lindsay. And so I actually remember texting her that Sunday, be like, Hey, I'm going to put you on the B side for this week in practice. And are you good with that? She goes, yep. Like she was all in, you know, like one of those things like, yep, whatever, whatever you think is going to make us better, you know? And so I put her on the B side and 
made the A side learn how to win without her, but it also gave us a really good person to defend against. Had, you know, we, we learned how to play against one of the best players in the country by then putting her on the other side. And we do a lot of intermixing, but when we actually had an A side versus a B side, um, she went to the B side. And I thought that that helped our confidence of our other kids that, hey, we can do this without Lindsay. You know, we don't need her to carry us. And I think that was that was very valuable as we got towards the end of the season. Yeah, you know, I love that. And so really what I'm trying to do is help paint a picture for uh, other coaches or young people trying to get into coaching or athletes to start to come up with their own vision or visualize how do you put together a, a team that is in the best position at end game to win, right, at the end of the season. And, and so, you know, the great coaches or evolving coaches pick little things from different coaches. So I'm hoping they're learning a few things here about some of your strategies because, you know, I'm sure that you've picked and chosen from other greats that you've observed over the years as you formulate your philosophy. So there's a second part that goes with your philosophy, at least at that time of the year, that's been consistent over time that I want you to talk all about a little bit, which is your um, scheduling. Like you have a unique scheduling system that's different than many other teams where you choose to play in tournaments around the country against the best. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the reasons why you've uh, gone that direction? Well, <laughs> my initial reason, and this is kind of, you know, not why we continue to do it, but um, in 2016, we went undefeated, 44-0, and the only tournament we had we had gone to was Kansas city. And it was, you know, we played like St. James Academy and Aquinas and all these other, like kind of that Missouri, Kansas area, um, some really good teams. And it was, and I think Marist actually was down there at that point too, but we, that was the only out of town tournament we went to. And I remember when it came down to, it and they were trying to pick a national champion and we were good. I mean, that was a great team with Brooke Haney and Ellie Shomers and, mm -hmm. Jessica Schlotman and McKenna Kirkpatrick. I mean, we just had, we had a great team and they put us at second in the country because we didn't play a national enough schedule following that year. So mother Macaulay, <laughs> let me bring this full circle one first. So my competitive side is like, I want to play mother Macaulay. Let's go. You know, like when can we play? So they had actually reached out for us to join their a six challenge in Chicago, which is like one of the big tournaments on that side for the East you know, teams over on that, um, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, like kind of that area, Iowa. And they had an opening. And the only way into this tournament is either invite or qualify in another tournament. And so we had an invite. And so we took it because it was at Macaulay. We've yet to play Mother Macaulay at the tournament, but it was a great opportunity for us to go somewhere within driving distance, play a bunch of really good teams um, and grow from that. And then Last year, we were invited to Durango, which would have been like kind of on the West. And obviously, pre-COVID, we had really high expectations for our team last year in the 2019 season or 2020 season. Um, so we have the bar set way up here. Well, all those tournaments are canceled, every single one. And when I met with my seniors this summer, I was just like, hey, do you want me to schedule as aggressively as I normally do? And they're like, yes, I'm like, do you want to go, you know, so we are like talking about Florida and these ones in Florida actually fit best into our schedule. Um, really good tournament down that area. Actually, the team that we lost to in the round of eight um, mm -hmm. went on to win the 4A state championship in Florida. So when we were playing some of the best teams from down in that area, so you have Georgia, Carolinas, I think there was like 13 states represented at that tournament. So for us to finish in the top eight of mm -hmm. that tournament was was really good for this team. But the seniors were like all in, like they, they're on board with being challenged. And my goal is to schedule them aggressively every single year. So that maybe we do, like, I think we had eight losses this year, mm -hmm. big deal. You know, like that's not, our, our goal isn't to win every tournament we go into. Our goal is to continue to improve, mm -hmm. find our weaknesses, build on that, you know, and then our goal is to win the class B state championship. We mm -hmm. don't care what we finish all class. Like we have one goal and that is to win state. And if the other things align and we win those other things and cool, but that's like, that's not our goal. So we always have to keep that in perspective. And I told them, I'm like, you know, we might have some, some rough patches, you know, like our tournament, we went one and three this year. Mm -hmm. It was a great tournament. Every single team that we lost to was ranked in the top 25 in the nation, but we learned from that, you know? So 
I think if I'm a young coach listening, I think number one, you have to know what or how to learn from those experiences, right? So like you could lose, but if you don't know how to fix why you're losing or like what you're learning, then it really doesn't going to help your team. It's going to be demoralizing. So I think it's one of those things where not only do you put them in, in positions where they could fail, but then you know how to nurture them out of that position, you know, because you go one in three, that's, that's tough, you know, and I didn't probably handle that the best way. I, I really went at them that next week and, and put a lot of pressure on them. And I learned a lot about my team. You know, I learned that they do better with love and accountability and, and that type of coaching versus like, you know, you make a mistake, you run, you make a mistake, you run. Well, they like, that was horrible for them. So we kind of like shifted how the whole team culture for the year and how we treated them. We just started this upward swing with them at the end of the season. And it was, it was pretty cool to see how those kids flourished with the proper, like love and accountability. So yeah. Anyways, it's just, it's fun, you know, scheduling for me is fun and I want the season to be hard and I want us to learn from it. And, but the kids also have to be mature enough to know, like they're going to take some knocks mm -hmm. in the process. Is that why you chose to ask them this year? Or has that always been your um, stance to ask the kids or the ladies if they want to have an aggressive schedule like that? Or was it because you had lost so many people that you wanted their buy-in or why did you ask their opinion this time? I've always asked the seniors. Like it wasn't a this time thing. I always ask them, um, even when Live Vegas called, I asked those singers, hey, do you guys want to do this? You know, and, mm -hmm. and I've done that previously, but I also have to ask admin and I have to like, there's a process I have to go through. You know, there's, we have to, we have to do a ton of camps at SCUT, you know, to, to even fund these trips. Mm -hmm. You know, the school pays, doesn't pay for them. I do. So mm -hmm. not I, or, you know, the volleyball does, mm -hmm. but um, I like to ask them because I want to see where their heads are as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if my goals are not aligned with my team's goals, we're going to have problems, mm -hmm. you know, so I need to make sure they're on the same page that I am. Yeah. So I want to take this back to a, um, and we can, let's stay with, you know, it could be either year, but um, take this back to sort of the goal boards or value boards that we, that your team puts together, particularly at the retreat at the beginning of the year. Um, but I always say that, and I really learned this from the Creighton University volleyball experience, because Coach Booth schedules so aggressively. And there were years, particularly four, five, six years ago, where I was worried that we would get to the end of September and the team would have uh, some struggles with confidence if they were four and eight or six and six or whatever number they would be, right? And um, so we always had focused on our core values that the ladies had come up with, things that they wanted to be known for. So example would be, you know, in that COVID year, um, they wanted to be known, Creighton wanted to be known as the best practice team in Creighton history and to a culture of helpfulness. And they defined culture of helpfulness as starters would teach non-starters everything they knew, even though the non-starters were trying to steal their position. So they defined their values as well. And and of course, they lose to Baylor in Nebraska opening weekend, thinking that maybe Baylor is a team they could have beat or should have beat. And then it turns out Baylor was ranked number one almost all year, but they were 0-2. And, and But I asked the coaches and the team, like, how have you done living your values in the preseason? They said, we really have been the best practice team we've ever had. We've been a great culture of helpfulness. And so that so they, they were living their values and who they wanted to be, their identity. And it didn't mean that the next weekend when they had to play I think Kentucky and Washington and, and then and Northern Iowa all in the same weekend um, that they were going to win all those matches. They were all tough matches, but I think they had the confidence to know that they were on the right track, whether they were 0-2 or 2-0, because I always tell teams as well, one of the bigger dangers is when you're doing too well or maybe exceeding expectations but not living your identity. Maybe the schedule's easy and you start out 6-0, and but you're not living – maybe your communication value or your love value or your family value. And I always say it comes back to bite you. So I'm just curious for you because you do schedule that way tough. Um, talk to me about the importance of the goal board and the value board that you put together or the team puts together in August <laughs> or during the retreat that helps you stay in alignment with where you want to go. So every year we've done our goal board. Um, and every year, well, I guess I can't go back. I mean, I've been a head coach for 20 years. I don't know if I've done it for 20 years, but I've probably done it for at least, you know, 12 to 
15 years where I have them like, you know, they pick a motto, right? And their motto last year, what was their motto last year? Um, they're going to kill me if they listen to this and I don't remember. I don't remember what it was last year. Yeah. This year was only the beginning. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I have, I have a whole process I go through with my seniors every single year that starts on May 1st. Mm -hmm. So on May 1st, when we meet, we kind of come up with, I give them a bunch of things to think about. And then as we hit summer, they're thinking about all these things. And then we have senior breakfast right after the last workout. And at that breakfast, we, re, we go back to those questions and, and things I told them to think about where they come up with like their themes and their shirt words and, and all these different things. And then we go to the, then we have teams, you know, tryouts and then teams are made and we have our camping trip, which you're a part of on Friday night, where we do a bunch of team activities. We do a ropes course. We do, I don't know. I'm a very predictable person when it comes to my schedule. And um, I feel that that predictability, like the kids look forward to those things. So the seniors already are looking forward to their opportunity to speak at the banquet, you know, and, you know, and the, the juniors are already looking forward to our May 1st meeting. Like these are all things they look forward to because they're, they're part of our culture now. Um, but so the camping trip is two parts. So our part with you last year, we just did a vulnerability exercise. We did not do the values. Our program has values, yeah. our four values that are like top to bottom. Um, they're part of who we are. Um, we remind the kids of them often, um, but those are our four values. Okay. And then outside of that, we have this year, we did a value board with you where they came up with a bunch of different things. And I think at the end of it, tenacity, synergy, unified, and fearless were their four values that they wanted to live this season. Mm -hmm. And I think they exhibited every single one of those by the state tournament and through the state tournament. I think that I think that they it took them all season to develop how to live those goals. But when it got down to state tournament time, they absolutely lived those values. And I think that in the back of their mind, they were there because we had talked about them so much and we referenced them like in huddles or whatever it was. Um, I don't know if at the camping trip, they could even define tenacity or synergy, mm -hmm. but by the end of the season, you know, semifinals, they showed tenacity championship. They showed synergy. They showed playing fearless. They showed being unified. I mean, they truly exhibited those values that they had. And that was the first time we'd done the exercise with you for that team. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was, um, that was pretty instrumental for them this season. Yeah. So I would say, you know, a lot of coaches have what I call their foundational program values, which are your core values that, you want to make sure every team you have, right, for the rest of your life um, exhibits. And then it's your job to get the seniors to help, you know, get everyone bought in, right? But there are the things that you believe that you, well, you don't recruit to, obviously, but if you're a college coach, you would recruit to those values. Like you would, like, this is who I want my team to be. And here's my expectations. And then I think the reason why we did or, you know, why I suggested the values this year for you was because of the unique situation, because you did lose a lot of people. We knew you had a lot of talent coming back, but knowing that this year, kind of like you even suggested that there's some years you go to national tournaments and you would be disappointed if you lost at the national tournaments or if you lost very often, where this year, I think you kind of knew you could take some lumps, but so how do we keep the team on track to their ultimate goal of, like you said, winning a class B championship, even though the record, when people from outside look at it, go, oh, their record's not as good as some years. Okay. Which I think is also interesting because they were never ranked number one, but that's a whole other story until the end, which I want to ask you about. But so I think that's the reason why I like teams to do values exercises like that, where they start to own their own values that sit on top of what I call yours. Yours are the ones that they have to live. And then this is unique to this team. And not every team needs to do that, but uh, I thought this team maybe did. And of course you bought into that. And um, so it's cool that you saw an extra maybe um, benefit to that as the season went on. So, um, so let me ask you this. Um, so over the two years, we showed a video actually twice, which you know I said ironically the year before, I only showed it to two teams in 2020. I showed it to Westside Football and Scott Catholic Volleyball, both because I felt like they were on the verge of really doing something unique. Westside hadn't won a state championship in 38 years. 
They went on to win it. Scott was trying to be, be make history, being six in a row at the time. And we watched a video from The Playbook, which is a series on Netflix, um, which there's five episodes. One of them had Doc Rivers, who's an NBA coach. And um, every coach has to come up with five rules or five rules to live by. And we watched part of this video that had three of the life rules. I just wanted to get your feedback on how you thought this, the things that we listened to and um, on video may have helped your team. So one of the rules was in Boone too, um, which is, well, we can talk about that. One was probably my favorite one was pressure is a privilege. And then the last one, which was, I think equally I loved was champions keep moving forward. And um, we showed it last year in particular. And then I asked you if you thought this would be good to show again for this group, but they seem to equally love it again this year. Um, what were the messages that stood out to you in that Doc Rivers video that you, in you in particular, then how do you think it helped your team? Uh, first of all, the playbook is such a good series. Mm -hmm. Like every single one, like as soon as, I think it, Lindsay actually told me about it to begin with. Like, she's like, hey, Saunders, have you watched the playbook? I'm like, what's the playbook? I don't watch a lot of TV at mm -hmm. all, but if somebody like recommends it, then I do. I end up watching all five of those episodes within like five days. Like when I went upstairs and worked out in the morning, I watched an episode, like it was like clockwork. So when you brought it up to watch that, I'm like, yes, like this is awesome. Um, I really liked the Ubuntu, especially for last year, but this year was just as applicable because it's the life you live, right? Like we talk about kids all the time, like serving each other. They don't understand what it is, right? But without you, there is no me, right? Like we we have to work together to achieve our goal. So that I loved. Um, when champions hit, they keep moving forward. I think that's a life thing. Life's gonna throw you for some loops. And like, you're gonna, life isn't gonna be all flowers and ponies, right? There's gonna be adversity. There's gonna be some tough things that happen. It's all about how you respond to those things. You know, so you could quit, you could give up, right? Or you can just like, hey, it's all good. We're just going to keep plugging our way forward. Um, so that's, you know, that was a life skill, which very much applied to this year's team too, last year mm -hmm. and this year. Last year, we lose first set to Norris in the championship. Um, bounce back, keep fighting, you know, like I like how much grit our kids show. And I think that the Doc Rivers, um, the Doc Rivers, video 100% like encompass that. So I thought that was really cool. It's just really, it's just good reminders. You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't reinventing the wheel. It was just good reminders about what it takes to be great. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about pressure for a minute because pressure is a privilege yep. is, is one of, was one of Doc Rivers life rules, right? And again, not reinventing the wheel, but talking about how you can take pressure and either turn it into fear or worry or doubt or how you turn it into excitement or confidence or a privilege. Um, what has your experience been, either as an athlete or a coach or both, that helps an athlete or a, and a team turn pressure into a privilege or into excitement? It's such a mindset, you know? Like, I don't know how many times I've heard people say that they have a lot of pressure. I'm like, sweet, let's go. Mm -hmm. Like. You can look at it two ways and I can go back to my playing career and I would say that I was more of fear. I was more afraid of pressure. I really was because I didn't know how to make it into a positive. You know, I wish I would have saw that clip in 1991. Like mm -hmm. I feel like it would have had a different mindset, um, but we didn't have all those same, you know, in the nineties, we didn't have all the same opportunities that kids have afforded to them now. Like we don't, we didn't have, and we had sports psych, but it was very different than, my I feel basically mindset training right like it's just different I feel like now as a coach and like learning more I wish I could take this mind back you know into my younger days because now I really do see these as opportunities you know like pressure is an opportunity like we've earned this opportunity we we've earned the target on the back and I'm okay with that you know I I enjoy it I embrace it I know it's not the end of the world if somebody shoots in the middle of the target like mm -hmm. It's just, it's a learning experience for me, you know? And so pressure is a privilege was something that I think was really good for last year's team mm -hmm. because everybody wanted, well, 
everybody wants to beat Scott Catholic. We've earned that. And that wasn't, this year's team didn't necessarily earn that. Last year's team didn't earn it. It was, it's been a process of earning over 11 years, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that we just keep adding to it. So each team adds another reason why people want to beat us. Mm -hmm. And I'm good with that. Like I, I like to have a target on my back. It drives me. Yeah, it 100 percent drives me to be to be the best I can be. Yeah. And I love it how Doc Rivers said in that too. He said, I wanted our team to um, embrace this pressure. He said, I wanted our team to know that we're the Boston Celtics and all we do is win. And you know, then he said, you know, you know, we've earned the right to have this, right? So I, I want to translate it just real quickly into uh, just for my version of having people think through this. And this gets back to a little bit to the, to the four C's. And one of the four C's of elite mindset for me is confidence. And I always ask teams, again, let's say it's before the Norris match for the state finals. How many of you are going to be nervous? You know, and now almost everyone raises their hand. At first, I think people didn't think they should they say they're nervous, but now they all know that's the right answer. Nerves are good. Like we, we have strategies for nerves, but I always tell them that if we've trained confidence, which I believe we can train it, and I have the six ingredients, that if we train confidence, we'll still have nerves before these big matches and during, but there'll be no fear. And if we can play fearless, now we have a chance to really max out. And I always say that the reason why you can have pressures or privilege, and we'll take it back to your team, the number one ingredient of confidence for me, and again, it shouldn't surprise people, is preparation and hard work, right? Um, I think you would probably acknowledge, although you're not around all the other teams training, Probably nobody prepares harder or trains harder, both from a scheduling standpoint and a training standpoint than Scott Catholic. Fair to say? I, I'm, I mean, I'm not in other gyms. Mm -hmm. Like that's, I have a really hard time saying that we do it, we do it different or better. I mean, we might, every gym might look just like ours. I don't know. Um, but I do take a lot of pride of our gym culture, mm -hmm. you know, from, you know, the energy level to the communication, to the focus on training, to the sequence of development we do from beginning to end on a daily basis. And I know I put a lot of time into those plans. Yeah. So yeah. there might be tons of people that do it the same way. I don't know. Um, but I do take a lot of pride in our gym culture, which I do feel prepares us for big moments. Yeah, I love that answer. Because that's true. There are other teams that do it great, right? We know that. So, but you know that you do it as good as you can and you feel really good about the effort. So I would say we're halfway home to confidence if we put in the work. We have to earn the right to be confident. We have to earn the right that when we have nerves, we can turn it into a privilege or excitement. If we've cheated that process, that's when worry and doubt creep in. And then I always say, all right, even if we've we're fully all in and bought in and committed and prepared. If the minute as an individual, I start beating myself up when I make a mistake, that could be an athlete or a coach with all the horrible things we say to ourselves. Now we're hurting our confidence. So I always say it's our responsibility to learn how to master our self-talk. But then I also have a caveat with teams saying, look, not all of you are going to master your self-talk and some days it's going to fail you, but you're not playing tennis. You are on a volleyball team so your teammates and coaches can help or hurt your confidence. So the third ingredient for me is great teams get really good at having their battle buddies on their team and really their entire team and coaching staff know what they need from them, whether it's a verbal phrase, a handhold, a touch, eye contact. What can I do for my teammate to help them move on to the next point? And so I have these ingredients of confidence and I say we can train them. And if we train them well, it ultimately leads to a fearless state when it matters the most. And so I think that's ultimately why in many reasons why your team is able to be fearless when it matters. And then, you know, one of my ingredients is commitment, which is the foundation of all of it, which is being all in. Ironically, what I've told people about your team as it related to last year had nothing to do with all the other things that the, the training, uh, the example I give for a team that is as committed as Scott had to do with COVID, meaning your team was absolutely obsessed that last month of the season last year to go home after practice and not go anywhere where they could stupidly get COVID. Not that you couldn't get it for a lot of different reasons, but they, none of them wanted to be the person that went to a party or went to an event where they didn't know people and where they probably shouldn't have been and brought it back to their team. And I always said, I had not seen a team 
more committed. And whether that's, you know, following an alcohol policy or just making sure you make really smart decisions with COVID, because there were a couple of teams last year that lost out in the postseason because of COVID or missed a couple of weeks. And it turned out as because they were selfish and did some things they shouldn't have done versus, yeah, sometimes you get sick. And so my real example for Scott has been, this team's always been so committed to something. Um, at a very high level, better than most. So then that all of a sudden leads to this elite mindset. So let's, let's move forward to this year. So we play this challenging schedule. And again, I always, for me, I, I will equate this to Creighton Marquette, which is because I work with Creighton, but often many years Marquette has picked to win the conference. And yet Creighton has just won their eighth straight Big East Conference Championship, which I think is kind of funny because sometimes they use it as a motivation. Why are we fine? We're picked second again. And then they win it every year, right? Um, the record showed that you didn't have as good a record as Norris because you're playing in all these tournaments, right? Um, not that they didn't play a great schedule but you were never ranked number one there most of the season. Did that have an impact on you or your team seeing themselves ranked number two all season long, knowing that they were the six time winner of the class B state championship or had no impact at all? <laughs> I've, I've learned to not pay attention to rankings. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, there's somebody else's opinion, mm -hmm. right? And there's to some extent, there's something behind them, right? It's pretty cool to be ranked number one all season long, mm -hmm. but it's also pretty cool to be ranked number two all season long and mm -hmm. win state, you know, I mean, I just, I don't put a lot of value in other people's opinions when I know what we're doing and where we're heading. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's not like I sit there and like scroll through and see what we're ranked this week. Like, honestly, and I told Mike Patterson in the, in the, <laughs> in the interview after or the press conference after the state championship, I'm like, sorry, Mike, I haven't really read any of your stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I don't know. When you have a whole new team, literally a whole new team, Morgan Burke was the only returning player that played the same position as she, as the year before one out of 14 kids in the same position. That's like a 95% change of a team. The last thing I'm worried about is rankings. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm worried about getting better that day. And if we get better that day, then, you know, what else? Like I had a list on my board um, in my office where I kind of like throw ideas in the plan. And I don't know, my mind is always going and it's a place for me to kind of like throw stuff. But I remember on that board, it had four things on it that we had to do every day if we wanted to win state at the end. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I took a snap of it and I sent it to my coaches and put little check marks next to all of them because we literally like... Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't an offense day, we knew we had to work on setter hitter connection because we had a new setter and new hitters, you know, like there's just certain things if we want to win that have to happen, you know, and so even if it wasn't an offense day, we still had time where setters and hitters work together, you know, and we had these little four things that we had to do every single day and we knew that if we keep taking care of that, we didn't care if we were number one on in October. That wasn't our goal. You know, our goal, our goal is never to be number one from start to finish. Our goal is to finish number one. And, and we just, you know, you just have to keep your, your eyes on the, on that goal. We, there was never talk about rankings. You know, it just, it wasn't something that was ever even brought up. And that was all of us. I almost feel like you watch the rankings more if you're number one to make sure you're staying there. Mm -hmm. you're number two, it's a different, it's a different animal. I love that. And really what Coach Saunders is telling everybody here, that is when people say, what, is the, what does it mean to follow up the process? Or, you know, we're process driven. Well, that is just, she just nailed it for us, right? When she said, we have these things on our board that we can continue to get better on every day. And if we get better with those, those are, so in this case, those four processes, there's more things, obviously, but we were referring to that. If we get better with those four processes, the wins and the losses are going to take care of themselves. That's called being process driven rather than outcome given or looking at rankings driven or all the things we have no control over, right? Um, because a lot of teams and athletes get focused on the non-controllables. It could be anything. It could, it could be where we're ranked. It could be, you know, um, playoff points and who they put us with, or it could be, um, you know, bad calls in a game, all the things we don't have control over. And yet you said, I have this board. And I just knew if we could check those four off over time, we're going to live with the outcome. We're going to be happy with our outcome, right? And I always say it doesn't always mean it ends up with a W 
because there are teams that lose where they get to the end and they really do know there's nothing else they could have done. They either got beat by a better team that day. They left it all out there. That other team played the best they've ever played. Maybe we didn't play our best, but we did everything we could leading up to that moment. And then there's usually no regret. Disappointment as a competitor, but no regret as we move forward. So let's take that to the state tournament this year. All right. And because you were in a situation, at least in my, you know, well, that's, I've been with you for four years and, um, and I know you lost a set against Norris in the state finals last year with a, with a very experienced team, which I knew for sure wouldn't be phased by that set loss. And I think you knew that too. Like they just had the experience and the believability to know that, it didn't really matter, right? But this year's team, like you said, one of 14 in the same position, lots of talent, great leadership, cool kids. Um, but you get to the semifinal match against Waverly, another team I know, as you know, and um, things happened in that, in that match that I'd never seen happen before for Scott in, in the postseason, meaning for people who didn't see it, you, you were down, uh, you lost set one, you lost set two, and in set three, I don't remember the exact score, but I think it was roughly 22-20 and you're in the hole. And we're staring, you're staring um, death, you know, death in the, in, in, the, in the face, you know, defeat in the face. Could you take me through those first couple, first three sets and you as a coach, what you were trying to do for your team and how did the team work through that just for the first three sets? What, what was your experiences like? Is it unique for you and the team? Well, I told the kids, I think I aged 10 years in that match. Um, it was interesting. Uh, we worked really hard this state tournament on scouting and making sure we knew everything that was going to happen on the other side of the net so that we were the most prepared. And that was us as coaches. I think my first mistake was I might have given them a little bit too much information. Um, but that being said, I didn't give them a ton of information. Does that make sense? Like we knew what Waverly was going, going to do. We didn't know they were going to execute their game plan as well as they did. I mean, they, they played a great match, like hats off to them. Like I, you know, no matter how much film I watched, you know, Becca Alec did not have 37 kills in any of that film. She did not hit, she probably hit 500 plus against us. Like she was unstoppable. Um, her sister, Hannah, was her location on sets was consistent from start to finish, which set up her hitters to be successful. So they did everything in their power on their side of the net. They played a perfect game. So, I'm, I mean, first of all, hats off to them. Like, it, this isn't a, a scut. Mm -hmm. That's not a scut thing. But they were, Terry had them very prepared. Um, on our end, we were the total opposite. The first two sets, we did not execute a game plan. Um, we played timid and our whole plan was to come out and like serve hard, serve, you know, hit hard, like go, 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 like dictate tempo, all those kinds of things. They, they, dic they dictated tempo. Um, they out executed us. Um, and it got to the point where, you know, two were down Oh two. And I'm like, I never thought about the streak until set three, when they were winning 22, 21 never even thought about the streak. And I'm like, Oh God, I looked at my coach. I'm like, this could be the end. You know, like we're going to find out in three points if this is the end or not, or four points if this is the end or not. And my coaches were probably like, she's never said that out loud before, you know, but in my head, I had to prepare myself. If it did happen, how was I going to be with my team? Okay. So we're down Oh two. I think everybody everybody wants to know what I said to my kids between sets two and three. And I don't remember um, exactly what I said. I spoke from my heart. You know, I, I think I, they were out in the hall cause it was really loud in the arena. And so we had them out in the hallway and I went out to him and I dropped on one knee and I just looked at him and I said, you're playing like you're afraid to lose. We can't play like we're afraid to lose. I said, I don't know if we're going to win this game or not. I said, and I don't, I think I said, there's been five reverse sweeps today and we're going to be the sixth. I don't know how many there really were, but I had watched, you know, games before and there were a couple of reverse sweeps. And so I might've embellished it a little bit, mm -hmm. but I wanted them to understand that it's, it was doable. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and I kind of told them, I said, I said, we just need to execute. 
We need to follow the game plan. I go, I know this game plan is going to work if you execute it. I said, I promise you this is going to work. I said, think of all the time you've spent working to get to this point. Now your backs are against the wall. All I ask is that you play hard. And I was very honest with them. And I, I just said, I don't care if we win or lose this, but we're going to play hard and we're going to take it one point at a time and we're going to execute and we're going to see what happens. Mm -hmm. And it, and they came out and they started executing. They started digging a couple balls. They, they weren't moving when they were doing the little, they were playing more disciplined. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference. They were aggressive. We finally got a couple free points, held serve. Um, it's 22, 21. And I'll never forget this moment because Ava Haney is a senior and, you know, she had an older sister that played like there's been a Haney in the program every year that, that we've won one state or been in, you know, since like 2014, maybe 13, 12, somewhere in there when the, when Brooke came into scut. Um, and Ava had this look in her eyes and she had not been serving. I had someone in going, going in serving for, her, but it was 22, 21. And it would have been Ava or Anna who came in to serve for her. And Ava had this look in her eyes mm -hmm. Thank God I know my players well, mm -hmm. but I'm like senior go serve. Like I just had this gut feeling that I needed her to serve in this moment. And she went on like a two point serve run. Next thing you know, it's 24, 22. We side out. She serves two. It's 24, 22. Maybe, maybe the side out got us to 21 and she served three. I don't remember the exact process of it, but I remember it being that situation. She goes back, she gets an ACE. Mm -hmm. right and I'm like I call it senior magic right like she's been there she wants the ball in her hand and she gets us to 24 22 okay service and air it ends right um Waverly serves and we we score and I don't remember how we scored I have no idea but we won that set well that kind of gave us a little bit of hope you know so then we're attacking the fourth set in terms of like staying aggressive continue to execute make sure we're blocked on contact this is you know, this is where Becca hits, make sure we are there and stopped and then make the move like just little things like that. But just getting a couple digs, getting a couple blocks, just those little, little pieces along the way that gave them some confidence. Well, we win the fourth set, we get to the fifth set. And I think we're down 11, eight. Right. Before, like, oh, we, wait, before we go oh, there, I got to ask oh, you this only okay. because between the fourth and fifth sets, your teammate, your team goes out into the hall again. And you have at least a two minute conversation with your arm around your setter all by yourself, by the bench. Nobody else is around. And I'm not saying you have to say the, the details, but what, what was the purpose of you and your setter being out there by yourself at the bench with the team inside? And I mean, what, what, what were you trying to accomplish? Well, first of all, Abby went to the coin toss. So she was the last player left. Mm -hmm. um, and then when she came back and told me, why did I put my arm around her? Cause I love the kid, mm -hmm. you know, like I wanted her to know like, Hey, we got this, like we can do this, you know? And I asked her, I said, Hey, are you, know, what rotation do you want to start in? Who do you trust ser serving for first? And then she would tell me, and I'm like, well, that might put this person back row at end game. And we just had a very candid conversation about um, a game plan going into the fifth set, but I had my arm around her because I mean, this is what we play the game for, right? To be in these moments where it's 2-2, two, two, winner goes to the state championship. You know, we've worked so hard all season to get to this moment. Mm -hmm. Let's just, let's do this together, you know? And I think that was kind of my premise behind it. It was, I wasn't planned. Mm -hmm. It just happened. Um, but we came to a conclusion. And I found that with, with kids, players, people, if they know you believe in them, they believe in themselves. And so me putting my arm around Abby and telling and giving her some input in the process mm -hmm. shows that I trust her. I believe in her and that we're going to do this. And I think that that that's very important when it comes to team management. If I just make decisions all the time, then I don't know if my kids buy in or not. I mean, I, I believe in, I believe in investment from all the from all the stakeholders, including my kids. And so coaches give me input, players give me input, but the bottom line is I have to trust the kids on the floor because they're, they have the best vibe of the game. They're the ones out there. So um, yeah, that was all it was. It wasn't like a magical moment of anything, but maybe looking back at it, wasn't important. Yeah. I think she needed to know I believed in her.
you know, and that I trusted her and that we're going to get this done. Yeah, I'd call that a magical moment, actually. And, and the reason I say that is that people always want to ask me, what does ultimate trust mean? Because that's one of our core phrases that my Navy SEAL partner, Jack Riggins, which you know him well, that we, we, we came up with several years ago for a Husker team back in 15. But people always ask me, like, what does that mean? And this is a perfect example, right? Um, there's another level of trust that goes on between a coach and an athlete when they're a senior leader oftentimes and when you know your people like you say you do, um, where you have the confidence to ask them what they think and they have the confidence and, and know that they can share with you what they think versus, well, I don't think I want to tell coach the truth of that because she won't listen anyway or she doesn't like my answer. She might be mad at me versus, like you said, a real candid conversation that leads to more trust, more believability. Again, it does not mean you always get to win because you have that, but it puts you in that position, right? Because as you pointed out, after that magical moment, again, because as you pointed out, Waverly played awesome too, it was just a battle. Um, it's 11 to eight, I believe, Waverly in set five. Um, take me through end game there for your team and both from your mindset how did you and your coaching staff deal with the fifth set and being down 11 8? And how did the team ultimately get to 15 before the other team? Uh, you know, that's less vivid to me than set three. I, I didn't, I felt like we were going to win set five. Mm -hmm. So we had in Florida, you play the third set to 15. Mm -hmm. And I think we played five matches there mm -hmm. that went to a third set. Mm -hmm. And so we had played to 15 multiple times this season. And I think that's something that not a lot of teams get to do in Nebraska because we play the third set to 25. Mm -hmm. So the, the previous experience of playing to 15, we already had in our, we were undefeated in sets to 15. We already had in our heads that we are winning when we go to 15. Mm -hmm. And so we had that mindset already. So I had to remind them of that. Hey, we've been here before, you know, you're going to be fine. This set continue to execute. Um, I also like to remind them about, how hard we work and that no team we play will ever be out condition us, you know? And so they truly believe that they are the best shaped team mm -hmm. and they probably are. I mean, we, we work them very hard and we, you know, have to remind them that like every defense day that there was blood on the floor, there was a reason like we're, you know, we're going to be okay. Like you cried. Sometimes we had people that puked, like those things happen, but you have to take them back and like encompass the whole year. Mm -hmm. And just enjoy this. Like you are the most prepared for this moment. There's no doubt in my mind. All you have to do is go out there and continue to execute, continue to wear them down and things are going to go your way. And I think it was 10, eight. I called timeout. Timeout did not work. I was hoping it would. They scored, Waverly scored again. It was 11, eight. And then the rest is fuzzy. It really is. Like I never thought we were going to lose. I think it might've been, I don't know who went on the service run off the top of my head. It might've been Ava again. I don't know. Um, but their eyes told me they were okay. Even in that 10, eight, we're losing. Mm -hmm. We got this. They knew what they needed to do to win. And so winning that game might've been more, I don't know. Like everybody's like, you know, yeah, you got seven, whatever. And I'm like, God, I think winning Friday meant more to me you know, because that was two great teams, two teams that left it all on the floor. And you hate to see a, a loser in that situation, you know, but I'm glad, I'm glad we got to move on, you know, and we got a chance we had, it. we, you know, we earned an opportunity, but we had to earn it, you know, it wasn't easy. And I, I think that's what was extra special about this season. It kind of summed up this season. Mm -hmm. We had to earn everything this season. It wasn't like, oh, you're going to win because you have Lindsay or you're going to win because you have AG or you're going to win because you have the best team. Well, no, that's not, that's not how volleyball works. That's not how sport works. The best team does not always win, mm -hmm. you know? And so for them to earn it along the way and then Friday night really have to like work hard and trust each other and execute and like do all those things we talk about, show tenacity and be fearless and play unified, like all those things coming together. Um, it was a really, really cool experience. Yeah. So what was the mindset of you and the team as we head into the state finals against a senior laden, very, very talented Norris team who you'd had their number over the last couple of years, but they were 
they were great. They were prepared. They have a great coach. They were balanced. They have a great setter. I mean, they had all the pieces, right? Like you said, to um, easily come out the winner at the state championships and probably the belief that that was going to happen, you know, based on their season. Like I'm sure they went into the state championship game, absolutely believing this time that they were going to beat you, whether I don't know if they believe that in the past, I'm not in their locker room, but I felt like I, my gut feeling was they were going to, they believe they were going to win this time. That's maybe compared to years past. Um, what we, what was the mindset of the team? Um, as you remember it heading into the state championship, then after that battle the night before. I think we talked about it actually at the arena, like the semifinals is the hardest game to play. It, it is because everybody wants to make it to the championship, you know? And so the semifinals are super hard. Once you get to the championship, it's fun. Like you're there. All you have to do is like, enjoy your last moment with your teammates, you know, enjoy that last bus ride down, enjoy that last dance in the locker room, enjoy that last, you know, warm up together. Like it's just taking in all the moments. It's not really, I, if you make the championship bigger than it is, it can overwhelm you. And it, it's not, it's you kept it simple. Yeah. Just have fun and enjoy the moments. Talk and about the, the bench. Do you talk? I mean, look, teams that, that are on around know what I think of the importance of bench energy. But if I'm being honest and I, and I tell teams all around the country, this, and where I, when I speak too, which is the real, the extra value of bench energy, I really learned from our experiences four years ago with Scott, when um, they got beat a week or two before state championships and they acknowledged that their energy level in general was down one of the ladies decided they'd be the bench captain and i challenged that team to stand between every point on every single point they won every single day of every game of state because i knew they couldn't do it right and of course i was wrong because they stood every single point of every single game and they've met you know the interesting part is we never really talked about it again but this team stands on every single point now lots of teams stand but they do it when it's 23 22 it could be three to one and your entire bench stands and cheers to make it four to one in set one in an empty stadium on a saturday morning at nine and they've done it every single match every single year um what's your observation and the importance that the your bench plays in in the overall performance of your team Bench energy translates into floor energy. Um, we're firm believers that an energized bench and positive and noise and celebration helps the people on the court. I mean, there's no way around it. And I, ever since you made that challenge, the kids know, and I'm pretty sure any official that listens to this know I have to get warned all the time for my bench to stay back, mm -hmm. right? And I don't care if I get warned for that. And honestly, like that's a yellow card I would probably take and be okay with it because I think it's that important. Um, I don't know if we've gotten it yet. I think we got one against Waverly because they got too much onto the floor. Um, but other than that one time, we haven't gotten a yellow, but I usually give them a line like, okay, guys, you can get up and scream every point, but go to this line. Because what happens is people furthest down from the coaches curve around. So they end up like on the court. Does that make sense? And so that obviously you can't do that. And so I have to like remind them, okay, here's a line. And normally like with TerraFlex, especially there's like a crack. So I give them up to that crack. Or if there's a wood floor, there's usually a crack. So I give them up to that crack, but they know, like I take pride in those warnings because that means they're doing their job to help their team win. And then they feel like, I mean, everybody talks about role acceptance, right? The bench role is the hardest role to fill, the hardest role, but it's also probably one of the most integral, in, integral, how do you say that word, roles out there right like you have to have kids who 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 maybe never see the floor but they still celebrate as if they're in the starting lineup and i just think that's that's all about buy-in and investment and and role acceptance and you know all those little things that people want to have on their teams it's just part of that process but as a coach right i have to say that not doing that is not acceptable, mm -hmm. you know? So to make it part of our culture, which it has become, um, I have to expect it. And so it's become now an expectation where before it was just a challenge. Mm -hmm. And luckily my kids are like me when we are challenged, we like to prove people wrong. <laughs> and so, um, you know, you challenge them to be up that 
state championship and or that state tournament and we've never looked back yeah so let me ask you this I mean you kind of talked about the the just getting to the state championship now the fun begins what did they do so well at the state championship this year in the finals to really end up dismantling you know one of the better class b teams that probably have outside of a scut team meaning you know all your i mean it's probably one of the better class b teams in, in, in norris that we've had in years and how did your team go about what was the key to success first was the kids had fun second we scouted the crap out of them we knew we had to play great to win because they're a great team you know same with waverly we knew we had to play great but i think we we had more pressure in that game right mm-hmm. and so our reaction wasn't as good in the finals, we we simplified the information for them and we communicated like we knew what they were running every single rotation mm-hmm. and where they were going to hit. Like, I mean, Kelsey O'Connell, our JV coach and I, we literally watched film after film after film, did our reports, talked about them, combined them, found tendencies versus like adjustments and just kind of filtered all that out. And we we played the percentages and the kids executed and they had fun and they celebrated and they played to win and they played together. And it was like what you want to see every single year as a coach for the kids to play their best game at the end. Mm-hmm. And they did, they put it all together and it goes back to training and preparation and like what we did starting June one. And then once teams were made in August, like everything we do, all those four things on the board were a stepping stone to playing our best game at the end, you know, and I just, I'm so proud of them, right? Because they literally like finished their year playing their best game. Yeah. What role does love and joy play in the process of becoming a great team? Oh man, if you don't love what you do, it's really hard to do it. You know, if, if I didn't love coaching, it would be really hard for me to put in the time, right? Mm -hmm. If I didn't love my teams, it'd be really hard for me to put in the time, for my players, it's the same way. If they didn't love the sport, it'd be really hard for them to come and go through a practice with me. If they didn't love their coaches and their teammates, it'd be really hard for them to come in and go through a practice with me. Um, Joy is funny. You know, joy happens when things, joy happens easier when things are going well. Okay. So joy happens naturally in times, you know, when things are awesome, but when, when times are hard, it's a little tougher to find joy. It really is because you're you're on the ropes. And so when you go one and three and coaches are throwing really hard drills at you, there was not any joy in practice. So that was our goal as coaches was to find that joy, right? And they found joy by fun, right? These kids, they, they play the sport because they love it. It's fun for them. Like it's not my job to take the joy out of the game as a coach. My job is to instill joy. So I think that, you know, it's just, it's, it's kids doing what they love and coaches doing what they love. Yeah. One of the things and why, one of the reasons I brought that up in the post game interviews, one of your athletes, I don't remember who now said that, I think it might've been set to the team was down several points against, and, and I think lost that set, but they said that they were having so much joy on the court, even though they might be down eight or nine and then they get a kill, they still celebrated and had like, it was a national championship point. And so somehow they were able to translate maybe a joyless practices following a one and three tournament into we're down eight or nine points, but the best way to get back in this game and match is to experience joy, even when we're in discomfort. And um, so I thought that was one of the things I was most proud of with them was that because we kind of challenged them too. Like when we showed them that video of the university of Kentucky and they were down in set four against Texas and it was 18 to 13 and they made it 18, 14 Kentucky celebrated. It was like, it was a national championship point. It didn't mean they were going to win set four. They're still down 18, 14, but they did go on to win set four, which then obviously that won them the national title. And so I challenged teams to celebrate even when there's discomfort, like it, you can be down six or seven points. The best way to get to four points down is to experience joy when you're only five down. Or if you're going to wait for a series of runs to happen, maybe it doesn't happen because we're joyless. So um, I just thought your team did all the intangibles well um, that you needed to do to beat a great team and end up doing it pretty handily in sets three and four with um, 
like you said, just playing their breast. So a couple other questions before we wrap up. You mentioned that you simplified the game plan for them or the information. Is that something you learned uh, about yourself? Because you had mentioned that you gave maybe too much information in the match prior. Um, why do you think you gave too much information? Um, what was the why behind that? And then what did you learn from it that helped you change that behavior for the next match? Um, I don't know if it was, I felt like I gave them a minimal amount of information to accomplish the goal, mm -hmm. but I think they were thinking too much about what was going on on the other side and forgetting that really all they had to do is follow the game plan for our side, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yep. So, you know, being stopped like those little things. Um, we as coaches knew what they were running out of each rotation and percentages of who they were probably going to set, you know, and that was from lots and lots of work, but they, you know, and we would tell them where it was going, but then they would get so caught up and watching one thing, they'd forget about something else. So they just became over-consumed with information. Not that we gave them necessarily, I mean, you could say it was too much, but it was their process of filtering through it. So I remember after the game on the bus, I told them tomorrow, the goal is to bump set spike and don't let the ball hit on our side. <laughs> like that's it. I said, we'll take care of the rest. I mean, I, when I say simplify, I mean like simplify. Yeah. All we did was worry about our side. And I, that's another reason why we, we take these kids out of town is when we're playing in Florida and Chicago, granted, we kind of have a national name, but it's different than when you're playing in Nebraska, mm -hmm. in Nebraska, you're going to get everybody's best shot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so emotions play more into the games. And that includes on our side, like, oh, we don't want to lose to this team or we don't want to lose to this team. Well, when you're out of town, it doesn't matter, right? It's just you and your team trying to get better. And when it, when you don't have to worry about the emotion on the other side, mm -hmm. you learn a lot more about yourselves, you know? And, and I think that that's kind of, we went back to the basics and it was something that we learned over, over the course of the season that who cares what the other side does. Like we know as coaches what they're going to run. So if it's a timeout and, or we're down, we can give them some information they need to know. And we were just yelling out, you know, what they needed to know. And, and they didn't over consume with that information. So it wasn't so much of what we were giving them. It was how they were taking it. They stayed loose and free. We gave them things to watch. And for the most part, the Norse did what we expected them to do. And that, that helps build confidence, right? Like, okay, they say, this is going to happen. That's what happened. You know, and so now they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we got this. We got this. So then they develop more confidence in it. So, I mean, it was probably oversimplification to a certain extent. I mean, the bottom line was take care of our side, have fun, play free. And what's going to happen is going to happen. But you've put yourself in the position to get it done. I did not know they would play as well as they did. Mm -hmm. And they, it was it was a joy to watch them truly like show their their they maxed out. I mean, that, there's no other way to put it. Yeah. So, all right. We've won seven in a row. You've been a coach a long time, but I know you, right? Growth mindset, evolve. Can you identify on the spot one or two things that you think you still need to do better as a coach or where you want to evolve in what areas, if it's non-specific? Um, God, there's so many things I need to get better at. <laughs> there really are. Like, I'm constantly um, evolving as far as like my practice plans. I think my, my practices are probably one of the best things I do, but they're also always evolving. Like I've already, I've already started my board for next year of things that, that I feel that we need to, you know, work on or do better. Maybe that didn't work as well. Um, I still need to get better. I'm older. And so understanding the vibe of the team is harder for me now than it was when I was 20 years old. You know, and so I still need to do a better job. Like, I think if I would have known the vibe of the team better then I wouldn't have approached them the way I did in practices after, even though I reached out to a lot of people and they agreed. And like, if I would have followed my heart and gut, I don't know if I would have done it that way, you know, and then, you know, there's, there's just, there's just a lot of things I could do better, you know, like training wise, is there things that we knew it need to adjust because, you know, volleyball is just evolving. You know, but I'm also one that I'm not going to jump on a bandwagon and just change things to change things. Like you've got to prove to me that that's going to be more efficient in the long run, not just for, you know, one or two points. So I don't know. I, I think I thought that I think I have a great staff that 100% will be like, this is not good. 
or we need to do this better. And, and we, and they're not all yes people. I have a lot of no people around me and I love it because that forces me to really think about my decisions, you know, like, Hey, what do we need? You know, give me three things that we need to work on. And they'll give me three things. And I might not have thought of any of those things. And so I'm like, Oh yeah, you're right. We do need to do that. Or like, how do we want to approach this? So like, we, we made some adjustments mid season and how we did some things. And I thought it made a big difference at the end too. So I just, my ability to continue to evolve, I think is really important. My ability to get a good vibe on the team is, is really important. Um, and then just how I, huh, how I trans, like put that into action, you know? And so I don't know, I, I love, I love developing teams and I love the puzzle and then figuring it out. And when you've put that last piece in, it's a really cool feeling. Yeah. I love that for sure. So it's, so, I mean, it's um, not a surprise that you would could identify lots of things to evolve, right. And, and continue to develop. And um, it's one of the things that I think I most appreciated about you because at the end of year three, you or you'd won three in a row. And one of my questions to you is why are you reaching out to us, Jack and I, to help your team when you got it all figured out? I mean, that's kind of my, was I was trying to figure out, well, you've already won three in a row. Like you got it all figured out. What do you need? And you were able to articulate very well to me in five, 10, 15 minutes, the things that you wanted to have your team continue to evolve and do better. Even though you were very happy with what had happened, you knew that you had some more things you wanted to teach them on the mindset side and the and, and all the things you're doing on the physical, technical, and tactical sides. And so that's why I always had a feeling from day one, it was going to be just a really fun journey with you because I love the coaches who are already successful, um, but still feel like they have to evolve and there's more out there if they want to either stay where they're at, get better, keep the competition from catching them, because that's hard to do. It's You ask any of the greats, it's harder to stay at the top than get to the top um, for a lot of the reasons you mentioned. And then one of the things I wanted to just say, and then I'll ask you if you have anything else, is that you, what you said to me about not having all yes people on your team, I really challenge coaches or anybody that's leading an organization to not have all yes people, to have a team within a team, meaning people you trust, sometimes from different backgrounds, sometimes all coaches, but meaning that they're willing to tell you the truth. They're willing to tell you what you need to hear versus well, I know what I want to say, but I'm not going to say it because when I do, I either get shot down or I'm never going to say it because somebody else got shot down or whatever. And then it just leads to um, little progression and innovation on a team. And so for you to have a group around you willing to tell you the truth, tells you all about the leader. I say the leader gets overcredited, but they also get undercredited. It always starts at the top. And um, you're the, one of the best I've ever been around to do what you do. And not just from winning, right? Because like you said, you might not have ended up winning this year, but you took that team on a journey of love and joy and accountability that is going to help them the rest of their lives. It's cool that they got to have the final trophy, but had they not, it wouldn't have changed their journey because of what you helped teach them. So any other thoughts on your mind for my listeners as we, um, you know, get ready to wrap up part two of uh, another great podcast learning from you? No, just, I mean, thank you for having me and hopefully people can get some takeaways maybe that might help them. I mean, the bottom line is Nebraska is a great place for volleyball and it's partly great because we learn from each other. So, you know, I love, I love being able to communicate with other coaches and talk to other coaches and get ideas from other coaches because there's some people out there that do things a lot better than I do. And so to be able to reach out and learn from other people is a pretty cool thing we have in a state that's pretty awesome at the sport of volleyball. So I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate all the help you gave me. And I've got to give my kudos to Shickley and Bellevue West. Um, I wish I could, I don't know who the Shickley coach was at the time uh, when they had their, uh, was it six in a row? Um, but I know Joanne Kappas was at Bellevue West when they had six in a row because I was in high school and I remember looking and being like, wow, that's pretty incredible. And so to be sitting now alone atop is pretty, a pretty incredible feeling, but uh, just, you know, props to those coaches um, for what they accomplished, because I think every time a record is broken, right, I think you should give credit to those who had it before you. So much love for them. I love that. Well, great. Well, I'm looking forward to at some un 
known date in the future to uh, get back on and continue to learn from you in part three one day. But until then, we'll keep loving, growing our teams and um, trying to get them to max out at the end when it matters the most, like your team did in the state championship finals this year. So kudos and congrats to you and your team. And thank you for being on the Max Out Mindset podcast. Thanks a lot, Doc.